totally addicted to going, like the ever ready money, to going and going and going and entering and entering a state that I call hyper fatigue. When you enter hyper fatigue, sort of like the one or side you've heard about, when you enter hyper fatigue, the world is a different place. And you're like a god in it. The very fabric of space and time is all. Yeah, uh, 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 you can do it running real easily. Uh, run over ten miles on a hot day. <laughs> okay, it's almost like a sweat lodge for the uh, American Indian. A vision quest. Yeah, yeah, and they get their vision. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The the American Indians when they were young, uh, the men as a rite of passage, they would go and get on top of a mesa or something and simply go without food, water, and sleep for a couple hundred hours. Trust me, if you go 110 hours without sleep, you'll hallucinate. Believe me. <laughs> Hold in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You and I were talking earlier, and you, you described yourself as a pro. And, uh, I mean, in, in talking about that I, as a, as a police officer, when you and I encounter one another, I'm going to know you're not, and I, I know yeah. what you mean, but what, how do you define that as far as how are you a pro? I'm a pro in that I'm not just styling. You see, the average civilian, their entire life is a style. Nothing is real. They're rock climbers. Oh, rock climber. Yeah, yeah. Go to the gym. Rock climber. Hiker. Oh, I couldn't do well. Twice they've driven up to Neil's Gap and, and done the little last part of Blood Mountain and they climbed Blood Mountain. We're all different. We, we even, everything is virtual. We even virtual grief. We even have virtual grief. You see the candlelight marches for Meredith Emerson and other people and people show up and they carry the people that don't even know the girl. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't, and they carry the things, and and they look, you know, for the news rammer. Hey, son, if they want to grieve, if they want to grieve, what about if they want to grieve? I mean, thirty-five thousand people a year get shredded, maimed, and beaten to death in car wrecks. Okay. I mean, if, you know, what I'm talking about is a virtual grief. It's a, it's, it's a, so you're saying it's like it's the like, support the troop sticker on the back of your toilet. Yeah, car. yeah, yeah. It's a virtual thing, okay? And so everyone virtually is, is a style. Right? They're talking the talk and they're not walking the walk. And they're styling. And that's why you see posers. That's my word. Perfectly precious posers. That's what yuppies are. They talk instead of do, they pose instead of act. Because they're perfectly precious. Right? Okay. I really started seeing that phenomenon in the last days. I got to be my partner and everyone standing around perfectly precious and posing. They have these flat affects. They won't talk to you because they're afraid to. The yuppies work on the uh, philosophy is it's better to not say anything and let them think you're a fool than to say something and have them know you're a fool. Yeah, yeah. John, they're a little bit wiser than they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're posers. And the police officer can see that I'm not just styling. That's why all the hikers you see, 999 of a thousand, their dress as is depicted in TV commercials of what a hiker is supposed to wear. They're wearing all cotton. J you, only just now are you starting to see a little technical clothing. And you'll see some hikers with a, a technical shirt on, okay? And in, in other words, a non-cotton shirt, okay? Or microfiber this and microfiber that. It's just now. I was stunned. In 1990, uh, when I got into your microfibers, I predicted the demise of cotton. I said, jeans are finished. Jeans are just nothing but lousy, stinking rags. They're wet and God, they get, I mean, uh, they're heavy anyway. They're not comfortable. Soak up water. Oh, know. man, they never dry. They're heavy as can be. They're uncomfortable compared to microfibers. Jeans, jeans are out. Well, was I wrong? You know, everything old is new again. Oh, man. It's a uniform. No one, every, they, uh, well, what's the attitude you take to that professionalism as far as your, just your gear, or is it just extended to hiking, that sort of thing, or? No. Lifestyle, I tend, what? Yeah, I tend to try to systematize everything and uh, break it down to... You're the saying system. discipline and, and, and... No, understanding. Understanding. Uh, whatever activity you do, just like a police officer does, he just learns, he, everything for a police officer, every kind of situation, everything is systematized for him. 
and he does it by the numbers. And like the military. Yeah, yeah. And uh, except the police officer's training he's exposed to is just awesome. It's so varied. Yeah, many of them, many of them do. Uh, they're taught every kind of situation. The shoot, don't shoot training that police officers do these days. They use their their own service weapons in actual sets in you know, constructed bank lobbies or mm -hmm. parking lots, and they use their own weapons. They they wear armor, full body armor, and it's similar to paintball armor, and they shoot each other at close range with their own nine millimeter service weapons using a reduced power load and a frangible bullet. And it's so awesome to see them do that, man. It's incredible. They'll shoot it, and they'll just shoot it out just at, at ranges like that, man. It's totally awesome. And, and, and they do it over and over again, over again. So as a result, you see some little, you know, pudgy fuck police officer, man, that can handle a piece so good. Bam, 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 drop the magazine. Bam, 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 drop the magazine. Bam, 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 bam. I mean, just awesome. Just fucking awesome, man. And, and they're trained, you know, all the way by the numbers. And that's what I'm talking about. But, but, but really what as I mean... As far as your own training or as far as your attitude towards any summiting a mountain or whatever? Oh yeah, it's all systematized. Even my walking is systematized. I have a, I have a, uh, I have a block of instruction I can give you on how to walk. As far I as can, I, if, if I was teaching someone, listen, if I'm teaching someone about backpacking, I'm going to teach them how to hike. I'm going to teach them how to walk. I'm going to teach them how to dress, get dressed, and I'm going to teach them how to piss. Okay? <laughs> You'd be surprised how easy it is if you're pissing is to piss on your equipment. <laughs> your clothes or your equipment. You know, you got this, uh, especially with layers. I'm going to teach you how to take a shit. Okay? <laughs> right? It's all systematized. Yeah, as far as the walking, walking. like when you're, you know, planning to summon a mountain or whatever, do you come up with contingency plans as far as, you know, if, if I don't make it by this certain time, then I'm going to go down to base camp yeah. one, that type of thing. And, it, and you do, for purposes of equipment, you do worst case scenario planning. In other words, what if I fall and break a femur? Boom. And I'm, I'm, I'm cross country. What if, here's, here's the complicating thing. What if the dog goes down? Hundred pound dog. Huh. What? What? Yeah. What if your dog lane comes up lame? What if you got an old dog and he comes up lame? What you gonna do? Okay. You can't leave the dog and say, "Stay here. I'll go get the sure. Come back. It don't work. Okay. Here's the flashlight. Here's a whistle. Here's a sleeping bag. Here's some food. Here's some water. Cool out. Listen for my whistle. Blow your whistle when you come and show me your light. I'll have the sure with me. Okay. <laughs> you can't tell the dog that. The dog weighs 100 pounds. What you gonna do? What if you, you know? And you're not on the AT. I only use the AT generally as a, as a connector. I'll climb the mountain to the AT, work the ridge. I mean, climb the mountain to the AT, take the AT along the ridge, and then come back down another route. Okay. It's typical when you're really truly mountain climbing. Okay. So you cross country. What you gonna do if the dog goes down? What you gonna do if the dog gets his foot sliced up? Well, as I said, what you gonna do if the dog gets a thorn? In you gotta have those sweets. What you gonna do? And what else? Your glasses, reading glasses if you need glasses, okay? That kind of thing. Uh, it, it goes on and on and on. For a wintertime hike, if I'm carrying what I, what I really should carry, and you can't carry enough water, you can, it's just too heavy. But I'll, I'll typically carry a, a five and a half pound backpack, a North Face uh, Snow Leopard. I'm getting the Snow Leopards back, by the way, because I, I, my lawyer's getting them. He hikes, uh, Rob McNeil, he's a big time, uh, Appalachian Trail, etc. He's a real hiking enthusiast and everything. So uh, he owns all that now. He owns that. He owns uh, all my personal possessions and he owns my van. So as soon as you guys can cut it loose to him, I, I'd appreciate it. He's a good guy. He's my. He's the attorney for the public. Okay. And everything. And he's he's got. He owns my van now too. Okay. And he's going to keep money on the books for me also. But anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. You have all that. All that planned. Uh, it's, as far as like, worst case scenario planning, you. Well, I think that kind of extends though when you're talking about your your dealings with the police and stuff. I mean, you read ahead, knew the law, that sort of thing. I think you, that professionalism is kind of permeated throughout your. Is that the way? Yeah, it is? But I see. I, but when you get desperate, you ignore it. In other words, when you, you when you're going out to kill somebody, if you're seen 
by a single other person on the trail, then no, that, that, that day screwed. But when you procrastinate because you don't want to get up and kill someone, and you let it go and you say, oh, I won't kill anyone today. We'll just go hiking with my dog, have fun. Time, we're doomed anyway. And so you get down to the point where, well, it was like Meredith, I had $40 money and several days food. I was going to have to kill somebody in that, in that period of time. Okay. And when you get down to the bitter end, you ignore all the rules you set, which I did, which got me caught. Straight outside of your own criteria for... In other words, yeah. In other words, on Blood Mountain, it's a good place to hunt because it's the most used day hiking trail in the state of Georgia. And uh, this is a uh, three and a half mile hike up, 1,400 foot climb, and return. So it's a seven mile walk with 1,400 foot of elevation gain. And I'm amazed at the number of people that do it, but they're able to do it because they're not carrying anything. <laughs> they're carrying what they're supposed to. I've seen people in that bitter weather that Meredith was taken in, not 11 degrees at night. Uh, I saw the day before going up as I was coming down, the sun setting behind the shoulder of uh, blood. And going up, three boys going up, not carrying a single thing, and one I'm wearing shorts. Insanity. <laughs> They're betting their life, literally, that they don't they don't stumble and hurt themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's amazing not not more people uh, get in serious trouble up there. It, it does happen up there, but it's amazing. But see, uh, but anyway, it's a good place to hunt in that you have a huge selection. But it's a bad place to hunt in that you because they have a lot of people. People. So the way you would do it. Witnesses. So the way you would do it would be to lurk in a blind, so to speak, mm -hmm. off the trail, observe with binoculars mm -hmm. and lurk. But I didn't do that either because I like to hike. <laughs> so a bunch of people saw me and then it was a mistake to pick me up. Because as you said, uh, she almost wet my ass. You said, I, didn't you say, I, I bet that 120 pound girl almost wet your ass. She almost wet my ass. She damn sure did. I lost control of both of them, uh, both the knife and the bat. Showed her the knife, grabbed the fucking, it's a bad answer, so it's dull as shit anyway. All it is is a spike to stick with, you know, it's not a slasher. Grabbed the bayonet and somehow I lost control of the bayonet and it lost it, period, and it went down. I pulled the bat and deployed it, grabbed that! I mean, it was not my finest hour. It, it was not my, I, I mean, I'm better than that, I am, but, I, I found out she was a fucking black belt, too, which don't mean shit. Again, they're styling these black belts. They're, they're styling. They're not fighters. They're, they're, they're learning to do some little. But on the other hand, doing that kind of thing does uh, increase your coordination, okay. your hand-eye, et cetera, and it gets you more used to hand-to-hand -hand combat as opposed to an untrained person, even though they're not really fighters and she really she didn't do no shit. It's just that she had no. She was real quick with her hands and had no hesitation about grabbing weapons and everything. And not only that, uh, she was hard to subdue. Uh, she fought like hell, man. Fought and fought and fought and fought. And then once I gained control of her and got her 10 to 15 feet away from the trail on that little side trail I told you about, she started fighting again. And I had to fight her again for several minutes. And her doing that is what got me caught. Because if I if I'd been back uh, to the uh, crime scene uh, just a few minutes sooner, just several minutes sooner, I would have beat those people that found the bat, and I would I would have picked it up. But but as it was, I had to fight her twice, and bring her all the way around the corner of the mountain, and then secure her to a tree, mm -hmm. in spite of her protestations and uh, then go back for it. So she, she caught me fair and square. Yeah. Now one there, thing I didn't ask you about this, uh, when you, since you're on that point, one thing I didn't ask you about, did you have to put something to keep her quiet, a, a gag, so to speak, or anything like never. that? No. She, she, was she unconscious at that point? Never. Well, I'm, never. Wondering, I'm wondering why she wasn't yelling when you just tied her to a tree. And uh, when you went back to clean the crime scene, what I'm getting at. There comes a point, they fight, and then they submit. Right. And a lot of it is because of me. Right. Mm -hmm. I reassure them. I reassure them that it's going to be okay, but just quit fighting or you're going to get hurt. I tell them, listen, honey, 
I'm going to spend life in prison just because she said no. I'm calm as can be. I'm a very experienced fighter. You know, the, the thing that separates a martial artist from a brawler, there's three things. One is the martial artist has a footwork. Secondly, the martial artist is not willing to lose. And thirdly, and very importantly, I learned this from the police, a martial artist doesn't get mad. Okay. If a cop is getting mad,